Hello, and welcome to Moments in History. I'm Linda Shenton Matchett, author, speaker, and history geek. While researching my stories, I unearth intriguing historical information that doesn't end up in my books. So I've created this channel so I can share these tidbits with you. But before we get started, I wanted to say a big thank you to all our new subscribers who have recently joined us. Today, we're going to talk about the U.S. Office of Price Administration. When the United States declared war after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States government created a system of rationing, limiting the amount of certain goods that a person could purchase. Supplies such as gasoline, butter, sugar, and canned milk were rationed because they needed to be diverted to the war effort. War also disrupted trade, limiting the availability of some goods. For example, the Japanese Imperial Army controlled the Dutch East Indies which is today's Indonesia, from March of 1942 to September of 1945, creating a shortage of rubber and silk that affected American production. However, from the number of laws, programs, and contingencies he put in place prior to December of 1941, it's obvious that President Franklin Roosevelt anticipated America's participation in the war. He inaugurated the Council of National Defense Advisory Commission on May 29, 1940, to include price stabilization and consumer protection divisions. Both divisions merged to become the Office of Price Administration and Civilian Supply, or OPACS, within the Office for Emergency Management by Ex Executive Order 8734 on April 11, 1941. OPAC became an independent agency under the Emergency Price Control Act on January 30th of 1942. The OPA had the power to place ceilings on all prices except agricultural commodities and to ration scarce supplies of other items, including tires, automobiles, shoes, nylon, sugar, gasoline, fuel oil, coffee, meats, and processed foods. At the peak, almost 90% of food prices were frozen. OPA could also authorize subsidies for production of some of those commodities. Americans received their first ration cards in May of 1942. War ration card number one became known as the Sugar Book for one of the commodities that Americans could purchase with that ration card. Other cards developed as the war progressed and included stamps with drawings of airplanes, guns, tanks, aircraft, ears of wheat, and fruit, which were used to purchase rationed items. Despite government efforts to keep it simple, the price controls designed, designed to flight, fight inflation led to confusing regulations and mixed results. Price stability tended to be an early casualty in most wars, and by 1942, a potentially dangerous inflationary pattern had already developed within the United States. Decreasing supplies of civilian goods conspired with mounting war expenditures and consumer incomes in a classic wartime supply and demand cycle to raise prices at an alarming rate. The federal government responded with a complex system of price control along with related rationing and rent control programs. Three months later, President Roosevelt introduced a seven-point plan to control the inflation. The plan, involving several federal agencies in addition to the OPA, called for heavier taxes, price control, stable wages, stable farm prices, war bond buying, rationing, and less consumer credit. Part of the aim of the government was to siphon off much of the money going into workers' pockets from the hot defense industry. The price control component of Roosevelt's anti-inflation plan set up a general maximum price regulation, soon to be known in wartime parlance as General Max. In response to what was called the certainty of galloping inflation, General Max met with only limited success, partly because farm prices and workers' wages fell outside its authority. The effort also fell prey to growing complexity and unworkability, according to OPA Administrator Prentice Brown. Each time the OPA allowed a price increase to afford relief to a seller, a new regulation had to be written or an old one had to be amended. 
Some manufacturers found ways around the restrictions by making small changes to their content or packaging, thereby allowing them to call old products new ones to avoid price controls. Others kept prices the same but reduced the quality, and still others eliminated traditional discounts or less expensive lines of products to keep their profits high. By April of 1943, officials were forced to acknowledge that a more understandable and effective system was needed. Following Roosevelt's hold the line executive order on prices and wages to battle inflation, the OPA embarked upon a completely new program of food price control. Armed with new authority, the organization moved to directly controlling the cost of items as the simplest and most effective type of price control they could possibly devise. Essentially, the new price regulations set uniform ceiling prices for an array of foods in each of four classes of stores in a community. The class is differentiated by sales volume between small and large independent and chain stores in terms of the exact ceiling price they could legally charge for an item. Critics complained that the price difference would put the smaller independents at a competitive disadvantage against the larger stores, but OPA officials rejected this reason, saying, the most important reason of the convenience of location and the personal relationship between the retailer and the housewife. OPA also developed a local board system to administer price control and its sister program, Rationing, across the country. Eventually, about 5,600 local war price rationing boards formed, with 8 to 20 members each, amounting to a membership of over 72,000 volunteers. The price panels set within local boards typically met once a week to keep programs running as smoothly as possible. The panel reviewed complaints from both shoppers and merchants and made adjustments for fairness and satisfaction. They would give advice to merchants and try to answer consumer questions. And the panel planned educational activities to increase community awareness. Price panel assistants also went into stores to check compliance. The assistants had a list of four to seven nearby stores to visit and would usually get to each one about once every two to three weeks. Many community newspapers published the OPA's Market Basket Price Book that listed the top prices for various brands and grades of food. Housewives were encouraged to take the list with them when they were shopping and compare the prices with those posted at the shops. If prices were not posted, they were supposed to report that fact to the local board. Food stores were not alone as the focus of OPA regulations. Price ceilings were also set on clothing, services, household appliances, fuel, and other items. Regional OPA offices had authority to freeze restaurant prices, roll back abnormally high prices, and set specific price ceilings. And the OPA took several steps to stabilize meal prices on trains. As with the food stores, price control officials weren't afraid to get into details such as menu items. Trying to protect the soldiers and civilians making short trips, officials took steps to regulate the sales of sandwiches, candy, and beverages made and sold by train vendors. In order to reduce these vendor violations, Revised regulations required that maximum prices be posted on the basket or affixed to each item of food or beverage. OPA also worked to familiarize local military posts with the new train day coach sale provisions related to the vendors so that men going on leave, furlough, or other train travel may be fully aware of their rights and not be gypped. As early as 1944, in its annual debate about price control extension, Congress discussed limiting the power of the OPA as World War II drew to a close, and the necessity of price, price controls was called into question. While some argued for the continuation of price controls to hold post-war time inflation in check, there was widespread support among conservatives and businessmen for the rapid deregulation of the economy as it reconverted to a civilian footing. However, OPA still enjoyed widespread popular support and the agency was renewed in 1944 and again in 1945. Finally, nearly two years after the end of the war, and some of its functions were taken up by successor agencies. 
Famous employees of OPA include economist John Kenneth Galbraith, legal